Hey everybody, and welcome to Nerd Talk. This is a bit of a lightweight episode today because Pixie is off at a meetup with a writer that she likes, Mark from markreads.net. And Sen is off doing, I don't know, but he's not here. So, it's just me today. Hello. So, I like cheats in general. And not all games have cheats in them. So, fairly recently I've sort of been turned on to the wild world of memory editors. And I actually started with this for Fortune Summoners, because... I don't think there was actually a trigger for it. There wasn't like a hard boss or anything. I'm just really into cheating, so I was like, hmm, I wonder if memory editors... Okay, the, right, that's what it was. Is I had been... I had done save edits before for Psychonauts because there's a part in Psychonauts where you're sort of just grinding for money and I was like, well, I don't, don't want to spend 20 minutes grinding for money. I'll just save, edit my save so that I have a ton of money and then load back in and I will have saved myself 15 minutes that I can use playing the better parts of the game, the narrative ones that I'm more excited about. And I was doing the exact same thing in Fortune Summoners because I wanted the best gear. And up until now, I had largely been, up until that point, I had been grinding for it by just entering areas, killing all the monsters, and then leaving and coming back so that they respawn. But I had gotten to a point where the equipment was really expensive, so I was like, well, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit with a save editor. And... Fortune Summoners is an obscure enough game that there weren't save editors just out there available like there are for things like, say, Diablo 2. And so I was, I was mucking around in my save file with the hex editor trying to find the money totals. But the Fortune Summoners save files are not stored in a very accessible way, which is to say that in my experiment where I saved with some amount of money, uh, went out and increased my amount of money by one cent and saved again while changing as few other things as possible. The save files were... There was not a single byte that was not changed between the two save files. And so, I was like, well, this is going to make it hard to figure out how these save files are stored and edit them. So I decided to look into alternate routes, and that's when I came across memory editors. And I didn't even sort of know that Windows makes it so easy to edit program memory while programs are running, but apparently it does. So I started with... I went through a couple of tools, eventually coming across Cheat Engine as the most useful one, and pumped up all my stats real high and played about the f the back half of Fortune Summoners with crazy high stats on two of the three characters. So I sort of had my melee tank character and my caster who does the healing magic at super high levels with lots of endurance and mana and stuff. And I had my magic damage dealer unchanged, so she was just at sort of the regular level she'd be if you were playing through this game. And it was kind of funny to play through that as two-thirds of a god and one really weak character who was dying all the time. But I had a ton of money, so I just stocked a bunch of revive items. But whenever she died, I just revived her. But yeah, from Fortune Summoners, I was trying to use that on The Binding of Isaac, which is a bit of a roguelike game that you play in one sitting. So there's no save files you could edit in The Binding of Isaac. It's just like you start the game and you either win it in one sitting or you start over next time. And I guess there sort of is a save file globally. That is, if you beat the game over and over, you unlock new things, new characters, new items that you can find, and things like that. But for a single session, there's no real save file. So, 
I was I was wanting to cheat at that, but that proved a bit resistant to my memory editor's prowess because the stuff like how much health you have or how many bombs you have or how much money you have is not does not seem to be stored in a simple variable somewhere because when I was just doing the repeated searches for the value of how much money I have and searching for values that had changed when I changed the amount of money I have, I'd eventually get it down to zero records. Whereas the way this is supposed to work is you're like, find me all of the values that are zero because I have zero money. And then you go and pick up a penny and you're like, I have one money. And you're like, okay, find all of the values that used to be zero from last time, but have since changed to one. And so on and so on. Until you only have a single memory location. And that'll be where the program stores how much money you have. But when I was doing that with the Binding of Isaac, it just dropped the list down to zero. And there'd be no memory locations that matched what I wanted. So I was like, hmm, this is weird. And obviously it's got to be stored somewhere, because the game knows how much money I have. So I was I was persisting at it for a while, and eventually I struck across one result via searching only for changes. So I, I wasn't searching for specific values, but I'd just say list all of the memory locations, and then when I'd change the amount of money I'd have, I'd say delete all the locations that haven't changed since last time and then doing that over and over and over I narrowed it down to one memory location that is actually a text string that is used for rendering the heads-up display showing the player how much money they have and when you change that with the memory editor it changes on the screen for like a second how much money you have but it is overwritten instantaneously every frame and doesn't actually have any gameplay impacts where you could buy an item with the money that you use, the money that you obtained by changing that text string. So, I was, I was thinking, alright, I found something that I can hook on to. I've just got to backtrack through the program to find where this text string is coming from. And so, th this triggered about, like, a two and a half hour long hunt back through the assembly code of the Binding of Isaac, which is written in Flash, by the way. So, it, it looks like it's a desktop game, but really it is just a, a thin wrapper around Flash. And that made it such that there were a lot of subroutines to climb back through to try and find the source of this money value. And I spent I spent a long time tracing back through that, and I got like 40 or 50 functions back along the hierarchy, and then I was like, I just sort of ran out of time, and I was like, oh, it's bedtime. And so I shut everything down, and... I never got all the way back to the beginning of the chain. I'm sure I'm sure it would be there if I persisted for long enough, but that would, that would take a lot of time. And yeah, so lots of more games should have cheats in them from the beginning because if if the Binding of Isaac made these cheats available to me, then I would not have to use crazy memory editors to try and cheat. Skyrim is actually real good about this because there's not only do they have the developer counts console on the PC version that allows you to do pretty much anything you want very, very easily, it also does not disable achievements when you use the developer console. So you can sort of just grind for achievements with cheats. And I actually spent several hours doing that and had a blast. There's uh, two perspectives on cheating, one of which is like that it makes games not fun because it takes the challenge out of them, and that's sort of true, but challenge is not always the reason you're playing the game. It is sometimes a nice element, and 
with RPGs, you get a good balance of the challenge and the excitement of being really strong natively in the genre because the way it's supposed to work is that you grind and you level up and you get new equipment and then your stats are so high that it becomes easier. And cheats are sort of just an accelerated version of that process both in RPGs and games that are not RPGs because I tend to play a fair amount of the game before I turn to cheats such that I know that things are hard and I have sort of a visceral connection to how powerful I am when I'm cheating. And I'm like, yeah, it, it means something to me that I skipped that, that half an hour of grinding to be able to buy the next best sword on Fortune Summoners. Or even on, let's see, what's a game that's not an RPG that I play? Da, 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 da. Well, okay, it's it's not a... It is an RPG game, but it's not RPG elements. That if I'm using... If I'm in Skyrim and I use Noclip to traverse terrain really fast, then because I've played a lot of the game, it means something to me that it would have taken me an hour to climb up that mountain. And it, it, would, it really would have been not anything special. I just have to cast the protection from blizzard spell that allows me to move and then run a little bit and then cast it again and then run some more and then cast it again and then run some more that part doesn't actually take an hour but as an example no clip using no clip to skip that would feel real good because i'd know what difficulty would have been there if i weren't cheating because i played a bunch of the game before i started cheating I haven't really played a lot of new games this week because A, not a lot of new games have come out and B, uh, busy with school and C, new games are expensive. C, looks like Alan Wake came out for the PC and everybody, I've heard a lot of good things about Alan Wake. I'm probably not going to get around to playing it. Uh... There's the Saints Row the Third DLC, which you'd think that I'd be super interested in playing because Saints Row the Third was far and away my game of the year last year. But I get the feeling that all of the DLC has been kind of crappy for Saints Row the Third. I sort of don't want to incentivize that behavior by paying for crappy DLC. But yeah. So instead of new games, I've been playing a fair amount of old games, one of which was Laura Croft and the Guardian of Light, which I had picked up quite a while ago during a big Steam sale. And I played like two hours of it, and then not really got into it, tried it, it didn't tickle my fancy, and then I fell off and never played it anymore. Until... I was listening to some really old podcasts, gaming podcasts, and they were talking about Laura Croft and the Guardian of Light when it came out, and they mentioned that it was really supposed to be a two-player game, a cooperative game, and the single-player element was sort of just the two-player version of the campaign squashed down such that you get all of the abilities of both characters as the one character. And after I heard that, the game made a whole lot more sense to me, so I went back and played a bit of that, and yeah, it was pretty good. They have some clever puzzles. Most of what I played was the uh, level where you're collecting a bunch of weighted balls to put on switches to open a gate, and there's like nine switches that you need to press down to open this gate, and so there's nine puzzles of freeing a weighted ball and bringing it to the central room. and. Yeah, those were all pretty good. Little bite-sized puzzles. Basic little combat is good. I also turned... I had been playing that on combat difficulty of medium. And the combat wasn't hard on medium. But I turned it down to easy, and I, I like that because... The combat is not hard, it's just sort of tedious, which is 
a characteristic I've seen a lot in these sort of things. But yeah, turning it down to easy allowed me to skip a bunch of that and do the puzzles, which are not any less difficult for having turned the difficulty down. And good puzzles. The other old game I played, I guess one or more of the old games I played, was StarCraft II, which I got on it, and I, I had been wanting to play a little bit of StarCraft II for quite a while, but I'd never gotten around to it because there was a patch that I needed to download, and my internet connection isn't very fast, so I was thinking, well... I gotta, I gotta download this patch, but whenever I leave the patch open, it slows down my internet connection for everything else, such that I can't do anything. And eventually, I just got around to leaving the patch open when I was out cooking dinner or in the shower or whatever, and it got downloaded. So I got on, and I've already done everything there is to do in the single player, and there's no value for that for me anymore. And... I played a bunch of co-op multiplayer back around the time StarCraft II came out, like three and four player stuff, and a little bit of one player multiplayer, and I enjoyed that well enough, but being real rusty and out of practice, I was like, well, I don't want to jump directly into 1v1 multiplayer. And of course, none of my friends are online since the game is a bit older at this point. There's actually a funny dichotomy in my friends list where there's most of the people had been offline for, like, 900 days, some enormous total. And the game hasn't been out that long, so it can't be that big. But it was, like, 130 days for almost everybody. And then there's just a small handful of people who were online, like, 10 minutes ago, who are obviously the people who had stuck with StarCraft and are probably really good at it at this point. And probably people who are like that are the ones who are on the ladder, so if I just jumped into ladder games, I'd be crushed. Now, I decided to try a 3 versus AI, and I, I, got, I jumped in queue for that, for matchmaking. And then it did not match me with a game nearly instantaneously, which I was like, oh. I, my expectations had become really high from playing a lot of League of Legends, which is just so crazy popular and of course free to play that matchmaking is instantaneous because there's a billion people online all the time and when i was playing starcraft 2 and the matchmaking wasn't instantaneous i was like wow this is really disappointing it's much better when it's instantaneous and so actually after about two or three minutes in that queue maybe not even that long i was super impatient but i i bailed out of that queue and i played just a one be very easy AI locally and destroy the computer because obviously the very easy AIs are very easy. Well, that about s sated my hunger for StarCraft 2. Uh, another old game I played was I played a bit of both Assassin's Creed Brotherhood and Assassin's Creed Revelations and I was sort of more impressed with how different Revelations is from Brotherhood having some distance from both of those games than I was back when Revelations first came out. Because I was... I was jumping into Brotherhood because I figured I, I kind of liked Brotherhood better than Revelations. And I was running around doing... trying to do abilities from Revelations and noting that they were not there in that game. They had not been added yet. Things such as running adjacent to a scaffolding and using your a uh, hook blade to rip the scaffolding down, and also doing a long jump, which both use the hook blade, which had, was introduced in Revelations. I was like, well, this is... I kind of miss having these abilities. They're not super special, but I like... Since I'm just running around basically without an objective, having completed the main campaign, if I run near a scaffolding, I want to be able to pull it down, because... That's the only thing I'm playing this game for at this point. So I finished all of my Rome renovations in Brotherhood. I bought all the shops and the landmarks. And for that, you get a cape that prevents your notoriety from going up. So you can go have bad behavior all the time and then not have to worry about doing little chores to 
reduce your notoriety to prevent the guards from attacking you on sight. And then, after I got that done, there wasn't much left to do, so I jumped over to Revelations, mostly because I wanted to pull down some scaffoldings. And I did that, and I found out there's actually no way to have no notoriety gain in Revelations, which is disappointing, because, I mean, I, as I've said, I like my RPG end games where I'm super powerful and I don't have to worry about stuff. So, it, there's you can never complete enough of that game that you can just go around goofing off and not having to worry about, not have to worry about doing errands. And they made the errands even more complicated in Revelations because they got rid of the posters that were the way I reduced notoriety in all previous games. So, the only way you can reduce notoriety now is by bribing heralds and killing officials. And officials show up really rarely. So, you know, mostly you have to spend money to reduce notoriety, which I was really, really annoyed about until I discovered that you can bribe a herald and then immediately pickpocket them for the same amount of money you bribe them with, and then your notoriety goes down anyway. So the herald is like, ah, yes, bribe money. And then you're like, punch them in the face and you take the bribe money back. And, and the herald is like, oh well, I, I may as well say nice things about this guy anyway. <laughs> cool. Works for me. But yeah, it's still a bit of a pain because heralds are harder to find than posters. Yep. And without my other co-hosts to talk to, that's about all I got for you today. See you next week.